Let's get into the book of Mark this morning. First, there's this old joke in youth ministry. I'm going to tell it to you today. Why not? And I, pre- I preface it, just hopefully you'll laugh. The, the old joke goes like this, that if you want to grow your youth group, then you should talk about either sex or end times. And if you really want to explode your youth group, then you talk about sex in the end times. Yeah. Bad joke, right? Okay. So there's no sex talk today. Sorry. But the idea of the return of Jesus will come up. And why do I talk about that? Like, we're just going to get into it in a second here. The reason why I bring this up right in the very beginning is because Jesus talks about it, so I'm going to talk about it today. And there's this temptation every time that Jesus talks about his return for everybody who is here and everybody who knows a little bit about this to overlay thoughts of books that are fun, good books. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to tear any books down. Like Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth or the Left Behind books, which are fun, fun reads, so don't get me wrong here. The temptation is to take what you know from there and to overlay it onto what I'm going to say. Resist that temptation. Resist the temptation. And like I said, these books are, are great fun, and everybody has a theory, right, on the way Jesus is going to come back. But here's what I want to challenge you as a church to do. If you, have, if you know, if you're here to this morning, and you know exactly how Jesus is going to come back, then I would like to talk to you about some lottery numbers I've been dealing with, because you have the gift of omniscience. And then, you know, the, yeah, I'm joking, we don't play the lottery, but then you've got the gift of omniscience, which is a joke because you don't have the gift of omniscience. Only God ha- know, is omniscient. So if you know exactly the way it's going to happen, congratulations, you're the only one. Not even Jesus knows all this stuff. So what I want to do is, and I love the, the, the subject of eschatology, the subject of end times, and at one point, I'm going to uh, crawl through the book of Revelation with you at one point, not right now, because there's a lot of other stuff I want to get to first, but I say all of this to say, as a, as a kind of a, a disclaimer, and a disclaimer and a preference, to say, take your theories and say, okay, these are fun theories, these are good. But Lord, I'm open to whatever it is you're going to do. (laughs) In fact, the first fill in the blank is this. If Jesus wanted us to know exactly how he would return, he would have told us plainly. But Jesus didn't. And Paul didn't. They didn't tell us plainly. There's some ideas that theologians have taken and built off of, but we don't know. And it's the, I think the point of us not knowing is that so we could focus on our relationship with Jesus here and now. And there's always things to look for, signs of times, all this stuff. But let me give you a really good example as far as the danger of knowing exactly how something's going to happen in the future. Here's the danger of that. So 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 16 says this. This is a Christmas text that we could look at during Christmas time. And, and it's, it's about King David, and it's God talking to King David. And he says this, When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to secede, secede you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I'll punish him with a rod um, welded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken from him. As I took it away from Saul, whom I removed before you, your house will be a kingdom. Yours will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now, when you listen to this verse, it's got two implications. One that King David's son, King David will not build the temple, but his son will. And we know this. King Solomon does that. But there's also this deeper meaning of this scripture that somehow King David's throne will be established forever. And so the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the people waiting for the Messiah looked at this and said, wow, 
there's going to be another king coming like King David. And he's going to be a political ruler. And that political ruler is going to do certain things like slay Goliath, like the Goliath of Rome. It'll be David versus Goliath again. And we're looking for this strong military leader. And so when Jesus came back, many people missed him because of their strongly held theories about how he would come. Does that make sense? So that's why I say we need to hold loosely to our theories because we don't want to be like the Pharisees who missed Jesus' second coming. Jesus comes back and we're like, no, wait a second. It says this is going to happen. We need to allow God to bend our paradigms, to change our minds, you know, and so that's why I say hold loosely back to to these theories. And I say that because the text that we're going to look at today, Jesus talks about his own return. And I say that because we don't have the ability to be omniscient. We just don't. One day Jesus will come back and set all things right. This is core to the Christian faith. This is core. Jesus talked about this. And we await that day that Jesus will again return for his church. So let's get into it today. We're going to be in Mark chapter 13. And um, I'm going to just tell you a couple quick notes. One, Chapter 12, we're not covering, we're going to cover on the podcast. So if you guys are listeners of our podcast, you're going to hear a lot about chapter 12 on our podcast, and then also any of your questions. So keep sending those in. We've already got a couple really great ones on the book of Mark uh, that we'll cover on the podcast after Easter. Secondly, chapters 11 through 13 are this discourse. Today's Palm Sunday. Today is the day that we traditionally celebrate that Jesus entered into Jerusalem, and, and that marks the beginning of the week that he would go then to the cross to suffer for our sins. But in Mark chapter 11, in the very beginning, Jesus enters to the temple courts and nothing happens. In fact, it's so notable because nothing happens in Mark's chapter. It's almost like Jesus walks up to the temple and nobody will confess that he is Lord there. And so he just leaves kind of abruptly. That's what happens in the book of Mark. And then chapter 11 and 12, you know, last week we talked about the cursing of the fig tree, about how it looks good on the outside, but there's no fruit on the inside. And chapters 12, we'll talk all about the different types of leaders that Israel has that are essentially leading people astray, except for one scribe. He, he gets it. And we're actually going to cover that after, like I said, after Easter. We're going to cover that a little bit more, and not just in the podcast, but also in the next series. We're going to cover that a little bit more. So then we get to chapter 13, and it kind of marks the end of Jesus dealing with the temple. And you have to understand that Jesus is our new temple. We don't have to go to Jerusalem to worship anymore. We worship in spirit and truth, just like Jesus said to the Samaritan woman would happen anywhere and everywhere because of Jesus' presence because Jesus is present with us here and now today. So we go to this temple scene, and in chapter 13, Jesus talks about how this temple is going to be destroyed, which is the center object for Israel and their worship. So let's get into it right now, Mark 13, verse 1. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones... What magnificent buildings. We're going to pause in verse 1. I know, it's just verse 1. And if we paused in every verse in chapter 13, we'd be here well into the night. So we're not going to do that, just verse 1. We get into this verse, and I want you to understand a little bit about the temple before we dig into everything else in chapter 13. The original temple was built by Solomon. We just talked about that. How David wanted to build this temple for God, but because there was blood on his hands and because of some other sin stuff, God said, nope, your son's going to do it. And so Solomon built the temple, and it was glorious. It was one of the, just the wonders of the ancient world, this incredible in its beauty and its size and its stature and all of that. And then that temple was destroyed as the Israelites went into Babylonian captivity. It was destroyed in a, in a battle. And as that temple was destroyed and people came back, there's these uh, books of your Bible, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, which, by the way, is one scroll in the original. It's two books in our Bible, one scroll in the original. Ezra and Nehemiah, and we see this character named Zerubbabel who begins to rebuild the temple. 
And he rebuilds the temple, he reestablishes temple worship. And temple worship, like I said, is the one place where God dwells. It's the one place where his presence is. It's the one place where you go to for forgiveness. It's the one place where you go to for the sacrifice. It's the one place there. But as the first century came in, there was all this tumultuous stuff that happened, you know, the um, in between intertestimonial times. But that temple still stayed largely intact until King Herod came to Israel. And King Herod wanted to show that he was a powerful king, that he was a builder king. And so here's what people will do when they want to show that they're powerful. They'll build infrastructure. That's what they do. So King Herod wanted to show to the Jews, like, hey, I'm your friend, um, even though he wasn't remotely. <laughs> and he started adding on to this temple, building and building and building this temple. In fact, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was the temple of Artemis. But Herod's temple was even way bigger than that. And he just kept building it bigger and bigger and bigger. According to Josephus, who was an ancient historian, this is starting to get really boring, I could tell. Josephus, ancient historian. Boring words, boring words, boring words. Some of the stones were 37 feet long and 12 feet high by 18 feet deep. Two and a half tons each. Massive, massive stones. So, when humble fishermen from Galilee who have never seen something like this before, or maybe they have when they were a kid, walk up to the temple, of course they're going to say to Jesus, Dude! This is my translation, not the Bible's. Look at that temple! That's huge! Those are massive rocks! What a massively colored the deal! And, and you have to understand that these stones are almost white. So on sunny days, you would have to advert your gaze from them because they'd be, the temple was just shining. It was so bright in the ancient world because it was colored white. And on those sunny days, you couldn't even look at it. When I was a, um, when I was a little bit younger, they built, do you guys remember the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles? The, what happened with that building? Some of you might not be able to, to think of it. It was a stainless steel building on the outside, and they polished it. And it melted cars across the street on sunny days. And I remember as a kid driving past it, and it was like, whoa, we can't look at that building. You know, the temple would have been like that. And so Jesus and his disciples are walking past this temple, and they're like, look at that. How incredible. They've never seen something like this before. And then compare that with like Philippians 2, which we're not going to read right now, but Philippians 2 tells us that Jesus humbled himself to our likeness, that there was nothing glorious or majestic about him, that he was just walking around like a guy. He didn't show his glory to his disciples. So you've got these two temples. Jesus, who just looked like one of us, just a guy, and this magnificent temple, and Jesus says, not one stone will be left on another. Let's keep, he's actually going to say that now coming up. And, okay, put your seatbelts on. 35 verses, here we go. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when these things will happen and what will be the sign that they're about to be fulfilled. Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. And these are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues on account of me. You will stand before governors and kings and witness to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whether you, whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what you'll say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will, be, will betray brother to death and father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. 
but the one who stands firm in the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go back or enter the house or take anything out. Let no one go to the field to, to, the field to go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be on those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place during the winter because those will be the days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never again will be equaled. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or look, there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather the elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth and to the ends of the heaven. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happen, you know that it is near. Right at the door, truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the, only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back Whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows at dawn, if he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. And I know what you're thinking. Pastor Dave, I brought a friend today. Why are you talking about this? (laughs) I'd admonish you to stick with the end of this verse. I I think after Mark wrote all this down, You know, and Jesus said, let no one find you sleeping after you've just read these 35 verses. (laughs) It's a lot, it's a lot to read. This, these verses point to two things. And like I said, I would like to go through every verse of this today, but there's just so much here that we can't. One, the destruction of the temple, which actually happened in 70 AD, and we could point to that as a historical reality. We know it happened, Jesus said it would happen, and we're going to talk about that. And two, his own imminent return. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that today as well. So Jesus says in verse 2, I tell you the truth, not one stone will be left standing upon another. He says to them that this whole temple facade is going to come down at one point. And that must have just been shockingly inconceivable to them because Herod built the temple not just for a place of worship. Herod was pretty smart about this too. He built it as a refuge if in case there was ever a battle or a war that the walls would literally be impenetrable. That's one of the reasons why he built this even better. And, it, and Peter and James and John, they're, they're like, and what is this going to happen and I love that they ask the question, when is this going to happen? But Jesus doesn't answer them when this is going to happen. Instead, he says, watch out that no one deceives you. First, watch out that you're not deceived. First, watch out that you have your eyes on the truth. First, watch out that you have your eyes set on me. That's the first thing. In times of war, in times of temples getting destroyed, in times of turbulent times, we could buy into false narratives really easily. And I think this is what Jesus is tapping into. In times of distress, so easy to take those eyes off of Jesus and to focus on something else. But then Jesus does give them a sign. He says, you have to watch out for the abomination that causes desolation. And obviously, you all know what we're talking about here, so we could just skip over this one, right? (laughs) Joking. What on earth is this? 
Sounds scary, right? Let's break this down. This is also mentioned in the book of Daniel. This is not the first time in the Bible that this is mentioned. But let's break this down. The word abomination means something loathsome or horrible. And desolation means depopulation. So what Jesus is saying is, watch out for something loathsome or horrible that causes depopulation. So what is he talking about? When did this happen before? During the Maccabean Revolt, in the intertestimonial period, so between the Old Testament and the New Testament, one of the, the leaders of, of uh, Greece, Antiochus IV, set up a statue to Zeus and sacrificed a pig on the altar. It was an abomination, something loathsome or horrible that actually caused desolation because there was a giant civil, well, a giant war that happened between the Maccabeans and the, the Greeks. And so it was this war that caused desolation. So when Jesus is saying this to his followers, they all would have been like, oh yeah, that was a couple hundred years ago. We had this big massive war. We totally get it. So there's going to be something that happens in the temple that actually causes a huge battle. A battle's coming. That's what they would have heard from Jesus. Many fictional writers have taken this and, and done all kinds of crazy things with it. And, and, and that's okay because Jesus says there's an Antichrist coming. So just what I'm saying is pay more attention to the Scripture than fictional books. Anyways, there's two things, there's two uh, great uh, things that could have happened here in, right before 70 AD when we know the temple was destroyed. And by the way, this isn't like a historical fiction. Like there, This is historical fact. Like The temple was destroyed. It, a battle started in April of 70 AD, and it finished in September of 70 AD. And uh, it was called the Siege of Jerusalem. It's a very well-known battle, and Jerusalem was flattened and leveled. But there's two culprits that started this whole rebellion in 66 AD. And Jesus said, when you see this, don't even run back to the edges. Like if you got hot while you're farming and you took your cloak off and you put it down, don't even run back and grab that. And, and pray that this doesn't happen in winter because you're going to need that cloak. It gets cold. And pray that you're not even a nursing mother because it's going to be bad for the babies. You know, run away. And so there's two things that are the culprits for the abomination that caused desolation. And the first thing, and this is probably what it was, what we think, uh, because it fits the time period more. The Roman army erected their standards in the temple. Their standards were these giant flags, and it showed images of other gods. So it caused a Jewish revolt. Now, a little bit before this, the emperor Caligula tried to enforce that his statue would stand in the temple. Caligula was a pretty deplorable guy by Jewish standards and probably by your standards here today. He was uh, convinced that he needed an heir to the throne. He kept not having a child. So he, uh, in, you know, he enlisted his sisters in the whole scheme of making an heir to the throne. Pretty, and then when they didn't, that didn't happen, he killed him. Pretty bad dude. Pretty bad dude. So he tried to put his statue there. So whether either one of these, we don't know exactly which one it was that caused this revolt, but it was the same kind of deal as Antiochus IV. It, caused, it was an abomination, a detestable, horrible thing that caused this huge battle war that depopulated Jerusalem. The abomination that causes desolation. And then when will this all happen? Jesus actually says... I tell, you, I tell you, this is verse 30. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. And so he's telling his followers, this is going to happen. This is coming up. It's in your lifetime. It's in your generation. In fact, it's somewhere around probably 33 AD here, and it just shortly, like almost 40 years later, this happens. It's within their timeline. And so some of you are like, this is ancient history. Why are we even talking about this? Why did Jesus even tell his disciples this? Who cares? And it's the next point that I think is really important for you and me today, because as we go into history, as we move into history, this next point is super important, because we've got things in our world happening right now, like 
like uh, China and Russia forging peace agreements and, and, you know, all these different things happening, like Iran and, and Saudi Arabia are brokered down by China. The dollar is now changing, and now the Chinese yen is, is getting bigger. And so you, you might look at all these things happening. There's a war in Ukraine, and, and, and nuclear arsenals are being built up. You look at all these things happening, and, and it's easy to go, wow, this is everything the Bible's talking about. And it could be. I don't know. But this has been happening This is what happens when powerful people get into the seats of power. This is what's been happening for thousands and thousands of years. If you lived during the Great Plagues, you would have been like, the world is ending, everyone's dying. You know, you would have had this thought. The point of why Jesus tells his followers this right here, right now, with the temple coming, uh, about to come down, is that he wanted to remind his disciples within that generation that he presides over all of human history. That Jesus presides over all of human history. He presided over human history then, and he presides over it now. The reason why Jesus would tell his disciples that that he is this new temple that he is sitting on the throne presiding over all of this human history We could take a long detour to make this point, but I'm going to try and take a short one here. When the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation and he saw Jesus on the throne, this is what he he said. He, He sees Jesus on this throne, and there's a scroll that he sees before Jesus, and it's all sealed up with seven seals. And this is a, this idea in the literature that they're writing that is so sealed up that no one could open it. The number seven means total. It's totally sealed. And John says... I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion, the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and his seven seals. The reason why I talk about this is John was there and he weeps because the scroll represents all of human history. And so John is weeping and saying, Lord, Who is able to preside over human history? Who is able to unfold human history and open the scrolls? Who's able to do this? And I want to pause for a second and flesh this out because this means that there's no political system that will operate in any way that will bring about God's purposes on earth. So I think democracy and freedom are great. I, I, I literally do. I wish everybody had it. But the reality is, and you have to understand this, that even if, if, if Russia and China switched to democracy tomorrow, we'd still be in a world of trouble, right? Because of human sin. There's no candidate, there's no political theory, there's no system that's going to make this world right. There's no leader, there's no group of leaders that will make everyone functions the way God desires for us. There's no one under heaven and earth who will make history operate the way God intends. So John weeps because God's purposes won't be fulfilled. And there's a few scholars here that point out that John is our spokesperson He's the embodiment of all humankind that cries out to make things right. And I think we get this on a personal level. We, we intrinsically know, we intrinsically get there's no political leader, there's no community leader, no tech mogul, no Nobel Prize winner, no celebrity, no more romantic relationships. There's no pastor even. There's not one who could ever deal with the chaos of life. Who is worthy? And the one is the only one who's worthy to preside over all of human history is Jesus. And I think he tells this to his earliest disciples to tell the early church, I've got this. I preside over all of human history. I oversee it all. The worries that you have, the challenges that you're facing now, the um, international struggles that you're seeing, I'm over all of it. I'm sovereign. I've got this. Because we can look at our world and pretty quickly come to the conclusion that things are spinning out of control and no one's in charge. But when you look at why did Mark even write this down? Mark wrote this book anywhere from six to four years before the destruction of Jerusalem. So at Mark's writing of this, Jerusalem had not yet fallen. So even as Mark is writing all this stuff down, Jesus' words, he doesn't get it. He doesn't get all that's going to happen. He's just like, I guess the temple's going to fall, and he's writing this all down because he's being faithful to what Jesus said. 
And then a couple of years later, the temple comes crumbling down. And it's like, wow, God presides over all of human history. Maybe you're here today and you just needed that encouragement. <sighs> Thanks for sticking with me through the weird text. We got more. We got more. <laughs> Mark 13, 26 through 27. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. So there's, the, oh man, the amount of translations of this verse are crazy. The amount of commentaries on this one verse is insane. So, so I can only preach one here. Jesus is coming back to gather his people. Do we know when? Yes, we do. Sometime after 70 AD. <laughs> We're in that window, people. Good news. Sometime after the temple is destroyed, many people have spent years of their life trying to figure this out and dispensations and all sorts of other things and making charts and all this stuff. And it's like, no, sorry, you're not omniscient. But what we know about this, about Jesus talking about his return, is that six times in chapter 13, Jesus says, watch, be on your guard. The world is going to want to deceive you. Watch out. Stick to me. Don't buy into the truth of the narrative of whatever political system you're under. Don't buy into the truth of the narrative of, of people who go, well, my truth is this and this and that. And like, Don't buy into that. Buy into Jesus. Watch out. Be on your guard. Many people will want to turn you from the truth. And this is what Jesus' whole point in telling us to come back. Watch out that you're not deceived. Watch out that you stick to the truth. Watch out that you stick to what's important about Jesus. And, and so many people want to get bogged down with, when? But Jesus makes that really clear. Verse 32, but about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father. Only the Father. So if Jesus doesn't know, should we spend countless hours and months and years trying to figure this out? No. It's intentionally cryptic. Because you live with Jesus now. If you live with Jesus now, you will always be ready for his return. Jesus talks about being like a house sitter. Uh, this was like a, a real job. It's a job now. But like being a job, like this is a job that people hired people full time for. Because if you were a merchant and you were traveling all the time, you needed someone to watch your property feed your animals. You needed someone to make sure that someone didn't, because this is common in the ancient world. There's an empty house. We're going to go take that house. we just go live in it. You know, you need somebody to occupy that house to make sure it's safe for when you get back. So he's like, be like this house sitter who's always waiting for the master to come back. And so as Christians, what does that mean for us? That we're always in right relationship with Jesus. That we watch out for bogus messiahs that Jesus talks about. Like, you watch out for people who are like, oh man, this guy's going to save the world. Eh, he's just as messed up as you and me. You know? Like, they might look good. It's, it's pretty easy to, to, to buffer out a political candidate and polish him up and, you know, shove him up onto a stage and go, oh, that guy, they're going to save us all. No, they're not. I mean, they got a hard job. But Jesus says, watch out for these bogus people. Jesus says there will be a, an antichrist. And you guys, I've been in churches before. I remember in youth group, I went to a church, and they posted a, a picture up on the, the screen, and the guy was like, this could be the antichrist. I stopped going to that church in high school. I knew it smelled fishy. And the reason why I did was because now that guy's dead and he's gone. That person they pointed out could be the Antichrist. There was a lot of fervor around this in the late 90s, right? This could be the Antichrist. And what I think Jesus was saying here is that there's going to, over human history, you guys, if you look at human history, you're going to come up with thousands of anti Jesus type figures. Thousands of people who destroyed the image of God and people who destroyed countries, who destroyed people, who persecuted the church, you're going to find them all the way from, you know, the, the, just every continent in the world, maybe not Antarctica, you're going to find them everywhere, okay? And Jesus says there's going to be many. 
And the point is that we need to fix our eyes on Jesus and we need to choose the truth. And Jesus models this the best as he, the new temple, is standing there in front of the old temple. And the point of the disciples, to the disciples is, you're going to have to choose which temple you're going to believe in. Is it going to be this one that's going to fall down? Because it shows political power, it shows authority, it shows power and dominance over the world. Or are you going to choose me who's going to go die for you? And we have to remember that literally after Jesus talks about all this, he's going to go die. This, believe it or not, these 35 verses in the book of Mark here are an encouragement to his disciples. And, you know, because he's going to go die. To remind them, he's presiding over all of human history, but I'm going to go die, and it's going to look like I'm not, but I really am. And then to remind them this, the next fill in the blank is, Jesus calls us to watch so we can fix our eyes on him. The church is always important to fix our eyes on Jesus. He knows he's going to go die. He doesn't want his disciples to fall away, so he says, watch out, watch out. And sometimes we go through rough patches in life. Sometimes we go through difficult things in life. And it's easy to take our eyes off of Jesus. But Jesus says, watch out. Paul will make this point really powerfully in a couple of places. 2 Corinthians 4, 18. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. We fix our eyes on that. Hebrews 12, 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. As we fix our eyes on Jesus, we remember that he's the author, the perfecter of life, that he sits on the throne, that he presides over all of human history, that whatever struggle you're going through right now, whatever that might be, Jesus stands victorious over it. Those with faith can endure any moment like what the disciples would face just a couple days later as their Messiah goes to the cross. We face these difficult moments all the time, and all of this preaches these two points, that Jesus presides over all of human history, and that we need to keep our eyes on him and not get bogged down with false narratives and and, and the lies of our society. But we always have to have this inextinguishable hope that Jesus will come back for his church and set everything right, and he will make all things new. But this starts with us. It's the first Sunday of the month. And on the first Sunday of the month, we celebrate communion here. So you should have gotten these when you came in, but if you didn't, we've got some in the back and some of the ushers have some. But this is uh, the time where we celebrate what Jesus did for us. It's the time that we fix our eyes on Jesus and remember all that he endured, all that he suffered for us, for you, for me. And so we take this bread, and well, first before we get into the, the words of it, as we take communion in our church, communion is open to all who call in the name of Jesus. So if you're here today and, and you don't know where you stand with Jesus, I just want to invite you, just, it's okay, let this pass, because the Bible says you eat and drink judgment on yourself. This is about celebrating and reaffirming your relationship with Jesus. But we also believe this is a means of grace. So if you're here today and you want to start a relationship with Jesus, the one who presides over all of human history, the, 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 one, the one who cares for you, the one who can endure, the, the one that we have hope in, if you want to start a relationship with him, this is a great way to do it. To say yes to Jesus. We believe Like I said, this is a means of grace and a time that God wants to do something new in our lives. As we take communion this morning, Jesus offers us his life on the cross. He offers us that he's going to take our sin and that he's going to shed his blood. So on that night, the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he passed it around. And in the gospel of Mark, he said, take it, this is my body. 
And although the disciples couldn't understand, they thought they were just having another Passover meal, they couldn't fully grasp what would happen to Jesus' body just days later. I imagine that the early church, when they took that bread, they wept because they saw Jesus' body on the cross. So take it and eat. Father, we just pray that there would be a time right now that you would help us to recall and remember what you've done for us. God, even though you've put our sins as far as as the east as to the west, you've forgiven us. Those who've called on your name for forgiveness, we trust and believe that you have forgiven us. God, help us recall and remember the joy of our salvation. That first moment that when we said yes to you and felt the weight of our own sin go away. Lord, that weight went on to your body on the cross. And we thank you for enduring that for us. In the name of Jesus, amen. And then Jesus passed around this cup of wine and he gave his disciples this cup, told them to drink it. And maybe you're here today and you need to make a new covenant with Jesus. Maybe you've had an old covenant with Jesus and eh, you know, you've been wavering and it's time to come back. This cup's for you. Maybe you're here and you've never done that. This cup's for you to say yes to Jesus. This cup, Jesus said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And again, the disciples couldn't quite grasp what that all would mean. But drinking from the king's cup was no small detail. It signified that you were covenanting with him, that you were with him. So if you're here today and you've said yes to Jesus a thousand times, this cup's for you. If you're here today and you want to say yes to Jesus right now, this is a new covenant. It's a new promise. This cup's for you. Take, drink. Lord Jesus, we thank you for enduring the cross. We thank you that you preside over all of human history. God, we thank you that you said things, you told us things in advance and that we need to be on watch in our own lives for your return. God, that we need to fix our eyes on you so that we're always ready on that day that you decide to come back. Lord, help us to do what the gospel says, to preach the gospel to all nations. Lord, so that you will come back. Lord, we love you. And we also thank you that you come in the hands and the feet of your church. Use us, O oh God, as we walk towards your death and resurrection this week. In the name of Jesus, all God's people said, amen.